<laughs> Welcome everybody. Today uh, I have my uh, dear friend Patrick Orlock from Copper and Kings uh, with us, and uh, Maggie Sleater is our uh, PR and marketing uh, emissary at Bitter Cube. And uh, tonight she's also a cocktail runner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, what we're going to try to do is the first three drinks are shaking, and so I want to get the first couple drinks out to you. Uh, then once I start to talk about how to build the drinks, it'll be a lot easier to listen to me pontify because we'll be well on our way to having the alcohol in our bloodstream. <laughs> so uh, for what you guys are drinking right now is called Death in the Afternoon. Uh, it's a classic uh, Ernest Hemingway drink inspired. Uh, well, invented and named after his uh, uh, book of the same name uh, about bullfighting. And uh, this is a uh, I, what I would consider a brunch drink. Uh, I'm not sure how many other people in the room would consider it a brunch drink, but it certainly is a, a corpse reviver of sorts. And uh, So I'm going to show you guys how to build that. And then next what I have coming up for you is a uh, Jack Rose uh, classic uh, brandy cocktail. And uh, we made a hibiscus grenadine for that, so we'll talk about that. So let me get this one finished up. Maggie and Patrick will walk that out. Talk amongst yourselves, and then I'm going to demo uh, all three of the shaking cocktails. And then I'm going to get out another two drinks, and then we'll talk about... Uh, uh, two of the stirred cocktails, and then uh, so on and so forth. Just uh, since we have such a large group today, um, that's what uh, we're going to do, okay? <laughs> Afternoon. It's an Ernest Hemingway cocktail uh, invented uh, after he wrote the book called Death in the Afternoon about bullfighting. Uh, he was a prolific writer, a prolific drinker. Um, I wish he was my dad. Uh, I think lots of people probably do. Uh, but uh, this cocktail, again, like I said, uh, it's a very simple drink to make. Uh, what we're going to do is basically just shake uh, one ounce of uh, the simple syrup. And that normally this, this would be served in a, in a champagne flute. Uh, we're using Copper and King's Absinthe Blanche. Uh, Lewis, how many different uh, Copper and King's Absinthe do you have here? Just the one. I see three over here. Do we have one of these? <coughs> Is it just this one? We have, we have the Absinthe Blanche, and there's like three or four others. Yeah, they have three or four others. So Patrick will uh, talk about those with, that for, with us in just a moment. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with one ounce, um, and then and whenever we do these classes like this, we just kind of very quickly talk about the tools and things like that. Um, if you're looking at buying cocktail tools, I've also got cards up here, info at bittercube.com if you have any questions about anything uh, tonight uh, about these drinks or other cocktails or you know, life or goals. Uh, this is a jigger called the Oxo Jigger. You can get it at Target. It's 10 bucks. It's graduated on the inside. So if you're going on our website or you're using these recipes that you have, you have all of those measurements here. So it leaves really no room for error. Uh, on the inside, you have quarter, half, one, third, three quarter, one and a half. So uh, we're going to do one ounce of the absinthe. And obviously, like absinthe, you know, I think this is kind of a, a polarizing spirit, right? Or liqueur, whatever way you want to look at it. Uh, very intensely flavored, and people can tend to shy away from things that taste like black licorice. This is not coming from black licorice. Uh, I mean, there might be some licorice in it, but it's coming from fennel and things like that. And so absinthe is always supposed to be diluted. You're never supposed to just drink it on its own. Either pour it over ice and then let that ice dilute it, or use an absinthe drip or just cold water. But you know the thing about absinthe is that you just add water until it's delicious, right? Because it's usually overproof and it's really intensely flavored, but when you hyper dilute it, it becomes this really, really great beverage. And so that's what's kind of fun about absinthe. Um, usually you can find smaller <coughs> bottles as well to play with. Um, and then uh, Patrick, uh, why don't you just talk a little bit, uh, number one, about this one, yeah. but then also the other ones that you have also, yeah. So we make four kind of four absinths. Uh, you can think of this one as the base. It is an absinthe blanche, so it's totally clear, which is why it's beautiful in the glass. It's beautiful for, for cocktails. It will louche, which is why you get a little bit of a milkiness to this cocktail, as you guys have probably consumed at this point. Um, it is 130 proof in the bottle, so again, very very high proof, so it definitely needs something to open it up. Um, again, it'll turn milky white. When you do add ice or water, don't be afraid, that's a good thing. Um, very stripped down botanical flavor, uh, sorry, botanical uh, list to this absinthe, which is why it's nice and clean. 
uh, grand wormwood, fennel, and uh, anise, which are very uh, kind of traditional botanicals, but there's a little bit of hyssop and black peppercorn <coughs> in it as well. And the peppercorn's really nice because a little bit of spice. What a bunch of hippies. Yeah, right? <laughs> a bunch of weirdos. Um, so that's like the base one, which is still one time. Throw those botanicals in for 18 hours, let them master it, still a second time to proof. Uh, it's a very straightforward. Which is why it's clear, right? So like, I think when we think about absinthe, we think about green, right? Well, that's because we're taking the distillation, right? Anything that passes through a still will end clear, right? Because vapor doesn't carry color. So if you're making absinthe, generally you throw all those botanicals that Patrick just named after the distillation, and that's where you get that color from. And so there's also um, absinthe rouge. There's only a couple places that make it. Um, one of them is these guys down here. Oh, yeah. uh, Corsair makes a rouge absinthe, and uh, 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 what is the other one? Rayhorse in Milwaukee makes an absinthe rouge. They're really, really cool. Um, but the light, like they, they usually have to put them in cardboard boxes because the light will, will pull that color out so quickly. Um, and so the blanche is done by the redistillation, correct? Correct, yes. There's nothing added post distillation to anything we do. There's no colors, extracts, flavors, nothing. It's all just what the, what the spirit tastes like. Uh, so think, think of that as the base. We have a gin basket above one of our pot stills, all pot stills, so there's no columns to infuse with. Um, we don't really use it for anything other than the absinthe. Uh, so we do three different vapor infused absents. Uh, we have a lavender one, which we pack the, the gin basket full of like fresh lavender petals, let it pass through. We have one that's a citrus infusion, so it's mostly oranges and lemons. Uh, and then there is a ginger one, which is really cool. It's like super spicy and pungent and earthy, so it takes like that spiciness from this. It's like really light. Dials that all the way up to 11. It's quite nice. Quite nice. What is a gin basket? Uh, so think of a pot still with a line arm that comes yep. out, it would go down to a condenser, mm -hmm. but you could also add one more step in there where the spirit passes through essentially like just a, a really a basket. Mm -hmm. um, the vapor goes, goes through that, the alcohol vapor, it touches what's ever in there and kind of like soaks into the most essential oils and stuff like that, and it'll pull flavors in from that. That's a bigger is, thing in gin, such as Bombay Sapphire. Is that right. over the boiling stuff, or is that somewhere down? No, it's line? further down. It's yeah. further down. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, most gin production, you, know, you can use gin baskets. So, most gins are done by macerating botanicals in spirit, either in the pot or outside of the pot, and then you run the still. Uh, but then some will put botanicals actually inside of the, dis the, the still itself, mm -hmm. so that once that liquid has become a vapor, the vapors are the only things that are actually touching the botanicals. So, it's kind of like like boiling broccoli versus steaming broccoli is kind of how a distiller would look mm -hmm. at it. And, and both of those things can be something that someone's desiring. Like, you know, beef eater, those types of heavy gins, they're boiling those juniper and all those botanicals for the whole distillation process. You're getting that really big, big, big gin, right? Bombay Sapphire is all vapor distilled, so they're kind of, those vapors are just kind of lightly touching those botanicals. And then also based on that type of thing, you know, if you're doing vapor distillation, uh, you're, you're pulling out different aroma molecules than you are if you're boiling, right? So vapor distillation, you can usually think of as like lighter, brighter notes, top notes. With the boiling, you get more of those uh, earthy notes. Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. So I've got an ounce of absinthe in here. I'm going to take, what does it say, a quarter ounce or a half ounce of uh, simple syrup? Half ounce. So we're using evaporated cane syrup. Uh, you know, simple syrup just needs to be a one-to-one. -one, so for home, you know, a cup of sugar, a cup of water will equal one and a half cups of simple syrup at about 50 bricks, right? If you make all of your syrups at 50 bricks, then you can interchange them, right? So a lot about what we teach at these classes uh, for, for the consumer and for the bartender is about interchangeability, right? So look at these, in, these recipes as formulas rather than as like specific recipes, right? So like you could buy any of the Copper, King, Copper and King's absence and make the same drink. You could also make, uh, use the syrup, you could make uh, a simple syrup or grenadine or a green tea syrup and you could make this cocktail. As long as you use the same formula, the ingredients that you put into it can be different. Lots of different sparkling wines as well, like a rosé is really great in this. Also a sparkling rosé. Excuse rose. me, yeah. how long will a simple syrup like that keep? 30 days, uh, yeah. In the fridge? Yeah, probably more, but that's what our, our rule of thumb is. Usually, yes sir. Uh, on the novice, so what's a brick? Bricks is the measurement of, of sugar in a liquid, right? Oh, so bricks. it's okay. basically on uh, the same scale as like 100%. So like 50 bricks, 
means that there's 50% sugar in that liquid. And so you basically you take a refractometer and it sends a laser through the liquid to find out what the measurement, yeah. They're 100 bucks, they're really fun to have at home, you don't need one, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have, you know, you why not? We use them, so, you know, because we have, we have a bunch of bar, pro bar programs in the country, so when we fly into a new, into a market to like, to, to be there on, on site, like we'll have our, our refractometer, and if I, I test their syrup, and their syrup isn't at 50 bricks, then someone gets, you know, gets us in trouble. <laughs> someone gets yelled at. <laughs> All right, so we're going to add orange bitters to this as well. Uh, the bitters are available tonight uh, in the back. You've got five ounce bottles of Trinity and Corazon, as well as one ounce bottles of the other six flavors. And we also have these variety packs. So inside the variety pack, you have a recipe card and then six of the main flavors that we uh, uh, created in 2009. Uh, the orange bitters, uh, we really pride ourselves on our orange bitters. Valencia and Naval Oranges, uh, they're all peeled by hand. So when we started this company, it was just myself and Ira, my business partner. Uh, we built the company in Milwaukee. Uh, we were making the bitters in Madison at uh, Yahara Bay Distillery, and now we have our own apothecary, 4,000 square feet, and we still uh, do everything the same way in terms of like all handcrafted. So uh, we originally started by making 20-gallon batches. We now make 200-gallon batches, and none of those techniques and, uh, of production have changed. So. Uh, I'm not the one that has to peel the oranges anymore, but somebody does. <laughs> and uh, for these orange bitters, every time we make a batch, it's a thousand liter tank, and it's about three pallets of oranges. It takes three and a half days. And, uh, you know, you just get a bunch of bartenders that think we're going to show them how to make bitters. <laughs> and, uh, and then you shut the door, and there's just one light hanging, and there's a circle of uh, folding chairs, and just a big metal pot. Yeah, yeah, you can leave as soon as you finish the job. So, so we're going to do two droppers of the orange bitters. These are also toasted spices, so it's uh, coriander, caraway, cardamom, all bloomed by hand. So we, again, even as we've multiplied uh, times 10 and more in some of these production batches, we're still taking saute pans and blooming the spices and adding them to the spirit uh, because uh, there's just no room for mediocrity in this sort of world, you know, and all of the things that are wrong with this world, at least we know that the bitters are still made the same way that they've been made since the 14th century. All right, so I'm going to shake this absinthe and this syrup. Uh, again, so really simple, two steps. Uh, these tins you can get in Cocktail Kingdom. I really recommend the Carico tin set. Uh, you can get those cobbler shakers with the three pieces, and it has that little cap on the top. But if you don't buy a really good one, it'll seize on itself as soon as it gets cold, and so you can only make one drink out of it at a time. And then as soon as you, use that, you lose that little top, now you just have a pencil holder. And it's like, how, how, how many of those do you need? I have a lot of pencils. Yes. Also, what is the ED? Extra I, dropper? I dropper. I dropper. Well, sir, if you need to ask that question about ED, I think that's clearly he doesn't know. Eye dropper. So when we talk about eye dropper, we're talking about these one ounce bottles. A, a dropper and a dash are synonymous, right? So if you have a five ounce bottle, you know, that's basically holding the bottle like this. As long as it's not filled up too high and going like that. One one dash, right? Well, that would be one dash. And here, you squeeze the bottle and it comes up about two thirds of the way. That's one dropper. Yeah. Thanks. ED happens at the end of the... Uh... <laughs> yes, sir. Well, if you have too many... If you have too many death in the afternoon, ED is also... It means something different. Okay, and then how many ounces? Is it four ounces? Three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half. Uh, what's in the extremity and what's in the cortisone? You got it. I will get to those things. Okay. Three and a half ounces of the... Of the kava or sparkling wine. Uh, any sparkling wine, I mean, you know, the thing about the sparkling wine is if, if you're using wine that you want to be drinking on its own, it's probably not the right wine. Uh, inexpensive is fine. This white clef, maybe not, maybe something a little bit better than this, but the, like Cristalino, for example, right? It's six ninety nine. dollars uh, that type of thing. You, you don't have any sparkling wine here, right? Yeah. What do you, what do you have? There's a whole Cocktail shop. stuff or? Lewis's <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's shop is like, yeah, I've got this seventy-five dollar bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I've got this bottle here that's uh, only one bottle. Just say, yeah. Yeah. Cooks, we have uh, Cordell. We have got. Uh, there's a bunch. We have a this bunch wine, of the grapes were rolled in the thighs of Italian virgins, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't use it for cocktails. Just throw some juice. <laughs> so, so the the uh, inexpensive wine. So Cooks, for example, would be a good good plan. 
But what you really want is something that you don't want it fermented on the leaves either, like the Methode de Champenois, right? You want it to be something that is force carbonated because we're adding carbonation to a cocktail that has already liquid in it. And so if we're using something that has like that cremant creaminess to it, it's not going to play well in the cocktail. So you want something that's inexpensive, that doesn't really have much flavor, and you want something that's just going to kind of pass through the drink. Yes? I got a few questions actually. Um, when you're doing like citrus bitters, are you removing the pith from the citrus bitters? That depends, sir. Are you trying to start a bitters company? <laughs> yeah. Second question is: Is there a common bittering agent that you use for all of them, or does it vary? So, uh, question one about the bitters: We don't, because we want our bitters to actually be bitter. I mean, if you taste most of the other products out there, they're actually not bitter. And so we really pride ourselves on the fact that we're actually making something that's extremely concentrated and has a bitter backbone that when, when it's diluted, it plays with the cocktail very well. Uh, so we keep the pith on because we like that bitterness. Now in small batch world, like if there are certain other things that we do that we'll peel oranges and then we'll go back and slice the pith off because we're looking for something not to have that, that astringent bitterness to it. The bittering agents that we use are things like gentian and quassia. Uh, quassia is here. This is quassia. It's the most bitter uh, plant in the world. And so we use the bark of that plant uh, as a bittering agent. It's in the orange bitters, the bully bar bitters. Uh, we use gentian a lot. Uh, gentian is what you know they use for like fernets and amaros and those types of things. Uh, but we also use dandelion root, kola nut, sassafras, sarsaparilla. All of these different roots, orris root, uh, add bittering to those botanicals. Okay, so this would generally go to flutes, uh, but we have here the death in the afternoon. Uh, what we would do to garnish this, and it all depends on, again, the glassware that you're using, but if it was in a flute, uh, this is called a, a channel knife. Uh, this is really the only one that we really like. And if you go on to Amazon, you can buy this. It's a Rosle channel knife, R-O-S-L-E. And you can see here all that oil, right? You see that coming up? And so what we do is we kind of run this channel, and when we run that channel, we can take the whole lemon, and we can strip the whole lemon of its peel. And this really nice channel knife allows us to have this really great pith on there, right? And that pith allows us to be able to, like, you know, really mold it well. Because I think we've all been, you know, we've all had a cocktail where they, they're trying to do a twist and it just kind of looks sickly. It doesn't really hold its composure, right? And so we have something like that, the death in the afternoon. Ernest Hemingway's favorite uh, drink. He said he would have one or four of these. <laughs> uh, so cheers, guys. Definitely have to go. Okay. You want to talk about those oils? Yeah. So Why are there oils in that cup? It's flavor. And <laughs> uh, Again, because uh, because there's such a high concentration of like uh, all the botanicals in there, and because of nothing. No cheap filtration done to our spirits. You might see some sort of haziness uh, when you chill something down. It's most apparent in the absinthe um, because there's just a ton and ton of uh, different flavor oils in there. Um, you'll, you can notice that too on some of our other spirits. If you chill them down, you might notice a haze. Chill filtration is the enemy of flavor. Um, all those nice, like all those nice flavor molecules are heavier. And so if you chill them down, you can skip essentially skim them off. Which is a boo. Um, luckily, we just don't do anything. We basically pull out all the stems and sticks and splinters and give it to you with all the, all the good stuff in it. Uh, okay, Jack Rose, has anybody had one before? One or two people? Well, everybody kind of just had one. Yeah. Let's play a test. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what this is. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Two minutes ago. It's good to know that the spirits are working. <laughs> Uh, Jack Rose is another classic cocktail, uh, you know, using the Copper and King's Brandy and Bitter Cube has been uh, supporters since this distillery opened up. In fact, I was in Louisville uh, just a couple months after they had their grand opening and your predecessor, uh, uh, Krista, picks me up in this like old beat up convertible at my hotel in Louisville and says, uh, Joe sent for you. Uh, and I, I met Joe here in the owner uh, in a, in, when I was at Town Talk Diner and he was selling um, Crispin. Crispin. And uh, he's, you know, she picks me up, she's like, Joe sent for you. And so, and I've only met this guy a couple times, like years back. And so I get in this like beat up car with this stranger and I just leave my hotel and I end up at this distillery and he takes me on a tour of the distillery. And, uh, so we got to taste all the stuff, tasted the absinthe. 
uh, before it was ever uh, put out uh, to the world, and uh, got to taste some of these brandies, and so it was a lot of fun, and uh, we've been big supporters of them, and again, American brandy, uh, actually a, a huge American tradition, right, uh, coming from Pennsylvania, you know, uh, apple brandy especially was something that was distilled here, the first distilled product in the United States, and so it's great to have uh, these guys uh, uh, you know, pushing that tradition forward, and the price point's great, it's inexpensive as far as like, the craft spirit world goes, I think that a lot of these products are really affordable. So you can see us using these at uh, uh, Cafe Alma, or so we're going to show you guys the Root Beer Manhattan from Cafe Alma, which is very successful right now, and then uh, also at uh, the Cooling Hotel and uh, at uh, Candy Can Wonderland, which is a 18-hole uh, indoor mini golf course and the place where dreams are made and nightmares are born. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you should go check it out sometime, but right now, uh, like 10 a.m. on a Thursday yeah. is really the best time to go because it's a madhouse. But uh, yeah, so we, we've got Copper Kings on the menu there as well. Uh, so Jack Rose, classic cocktail. Uh, you can buy a grenadine, but if you're gonna buy grenadine, make sure it's being made from like a small batch company. I know like, like Jack Rudy makes one. Do you guys have a grenadine here? Um, we used to have the Jack Rudy, but we don't have one. That's kind of the one that's like, okay. Uh, making it at home is a lot of fun and not too hard. If you're interested, I don't think the recipe's on there, but I can email it to you. But basically, you want to take Palm Wonderful, right? Because like people sometimes think grenadine is a cherry uh, syrup. It's not. It's, it's a pomegranate flavor. So it's pomegranadine, right? So pomegranate grenadine, right? And so you want to take palm, you reduce palm by half. So it's not a cheap uh, 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 syrup either, but again, you're only using half ounce to three quarter ounce of that. So you reduce palm by half and then you take equal parts of that and sugar. And uh, this, this will kind of be a little bit thicker than that 50 bricks that we were talking about. But what we also do is we have hibiscus to it as well. So it gives a little bit of floral note. So the one that you guys just enjoyed was a hibiscus grenadine. Uh, somebody walk me through the recipe. Two ounce copper and kings brandy. And we're always gonna start, I always say start with the, the most inexpensive ingredient first. Uh, we might have written it incorrectly today, but uh, well, how much lemon is in it? Uh, three quarters of an ounce. Three quarter of an ounce? Fresh squeezed lemon, super important. Um, you know, and, and always juice more than one lemon. If you're at home and just making a couple cocktails, you really want to use fresh citrus because that's really the big difference between what we're doing today and what everybody else is doing in a conventional bar setting is that, 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 that focus on fresh ingredients. And so, you know, we're using a syrup that you can make once and it lasts for 30 to 60 days. The spirits aren't gonna go bad, but so you really wanna focus on having lemons. You wanna juice more than one lemon at a time because not all lemons are created equal either. So the reason that we juice a bunch of citrus and put it together is that the pH will balance itself out from all of those lemons. So even if I'm at home making a couple cocktails, I'm gonna juice three or four lemons at a time. Uh, again, not a lot of money if you don't finish it all and you could always you know, freeze it and use it for something else. But really fresh is best when it comes to cocktail, okay? So three quarter ounce, how much can you need? So as you can see, it's a little bit thicker than like a, like a, like a simple syrup would be. I don't know if you can see that, I can see that. I'm telling you that, I just need you to trust me on that one. Half ounce of grenadine. What else is in there? Quarter ounce, uh, simple, simple syrup. Simple syrup, we're using evaporated cane syrup today. Yep, what, what's next? Uh, one erectile dysfunction of bitter tea should make it bitter. <laughs> Is it number one or number, number two? One. Number one. Okay. <coughs> and then how much of the brandy? Is there apple brandy down there? Two ounces. <coughs> so this drink is a sour. Uh, and so the golden rule of the sour is three quarter, three quarter, two, right? So three quarter ounce of lemon or lime juice, three quarter ounce of any syrup that's at 50 breaks, two ounces of any spirit in this room will make you 99.9% .9 of the time a good drink. Mixology. And that's why you'll have such a hard time going to places that take a really long time and have bad attitudes. You'll be like, I literally can make this drink at home now. Why did I even leave my house, right? So three quarter, three quarter, two. So we're going to use lemon, three quarter ounce. We could do lime. A Jack Rose can go either way. There's some classic books that say lime. Probably in the mid-1800s, uh, early 1900s when this drink first came out. Uh, this, I think, is a prohibition cocktail. So uh, that's where the grenadine comes from. We're trying to mask bad spirits. 
Uh, not, not that's not what we're doing today. <laughs> we're accentuating the great spirit. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the grenadine comes from that, and then uh, the apple brandy, again, classic uh, uh, spirit that's been uh, made in America since America was America. We're going to make America great again with this, you guys. <laughs> Two ounces of the apple brandy. Patrick. Before I shake this cocktail, will you tell us about that uh, spirit thing? So we make two apple brandies. This is our aged apple brandy called Blood Wall. Uh, it is a super cool product. Um, it's all that 100 proof, which is why it's awesome for cocktails. If you think of a higher proof in a, in a, in a spirit. I think oh, you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> ah, huh? Finish. Uh, I think it was like potential energy uh, for a cocktail. The higher it is, the more you're going to taste on the back end, the better your cocktail is going to be. Uh, minimum four years in bourbon barrels, which is where it spends the primary of its life. But it has three to four months of sherry finishing on the back end, too, which gives it some cool layers of flavor on top of the root. Thanks, sir. Why do we shake some drinks and stir others? It has to do with the citrus component, right? So we've got one more shaken drink, this, this uh, Jack Rose, and then we've got a Daisy. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demo this. I'm going to demo the Daisy, and then I'm going to get the Daisy out and another drink out for you guys. And then uh, we'll demo the rest of them, okay? Uh, acid needs to be not only diluted and chilled, but also aerated, right? So we're homogenizing these ingredients in the tin, which allows us to have uh, kind of like this creaminess and this balance of flavors. You could do the same thing here and take three-quarter of the lemon, three-quarter of brandy, and two ounces of brandy, and put it in a glass, even put it in a glass over ice, and taste that next to something that you just shake in, and you're gonna see such a such a, a, a drastic difference with those two drinks. And it has to do with aeration more than anything. And when you strain these cocktails off after you've shaken them, you can see uh, almost like you know air bubbles. You know you can see bubbles in the in the strainer. And I, I'm sure you can't see them from far away, but. Those of you up close can see them, and your head nods will allow them to trust you. <laughs> so it, it's 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 almost like it's not carbonated because that would be carbon dioxide, but it, it is it is uh, uh, aerated, right? And so that homogenization is what allows us to soften the, the acidity. Uh, and a good balanced drink shouldn't taste like citrus. A good balanced drink shouldn't taste sweet. It should be round. And so like when we balance that citrus and that sugar, the real true flavors of the, of the spirit become exposed. Too much citrus or bad citrus holds flavor hostage, and it tastes really sharp like lemon. Or if you make it and it's too sweet, it tastes like lemonade. It's too much candy-like. And so you have to have those two things in harmony. And when you do, then the spirit kind of pops through. Uh, hopefully you saw that uh, when you guys had this which you don't have any longer, but I do, so there's a <laughs> like, like some jealousy. <laughs> you know, and with that grenadine, it's basically a salad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, uh, we're going to do a daisy. So I'm going to demo this, and then uh, we're going we're gonna to batch this out for you guys. So the daisy, I'm going to give you these, okay? Yeah. Is the immature brandy sour. So this drink, uh, if you look on the back, is three quarter, three quarter, two as well, right? So same same uh, formula as the uh, Jack Rose, but completely different. And so what we're trying to show you is just that idea of formulation, right? I'm taking the same formula, three quarter, three quarter, two, and I, th I hope. Uh, so on the Jack Rose, you see it's it's three quarter, three quarter, because half ounce of hibiscus grenadine and a quarter ounce of simple syrup equals three quarter ounce, right? And so the immature brandy sour. Uh, at home, I'd recommend putting an egg white in this, but I don't really know you guys and care that much to do that for all 50 of you today. Um, maybe also the morbid obesity would allow me not to be able to shake that many egg white drinks. So, the, drinks that's not gonna do it either. so the, the brandy sour, if you're going to add an egg white, you have to bump the sugar up to another quarter ounce, okay? Because egg whites are really drying. And so if you're going to take this brandy sour and make it at home, I would say do an ounce of evaporated cane syrup or simple syrup or demerara. Uh, demerara is just more unrefined, uh, like sugar in the raw. Everybody knows sugar in the raw, right? That's a turbinado sugar, which means that that cane has been dried in a turbine or like a large drying machine, basically like a, like a dryer. And that, that drying allows the minerality and kind of like the molasses to stay in the sugar. So that's how you get that more rich flavor. And it's kind of more reminiscent of what sugar would have been like back in the day. Right, when these cocktails were invented. 
The thing about the unnamed branding is that it is basically the same as Pisco, right? Has anybody had Pisco? Pisco is Peruvian unaged brandy. Well, this is American unaged brandy. So, what's the best thing to do with Pisco? Make a Pisco sour. So we're gonna make an American sour with this American brandy. And so the uh, only difference I would say is that you should try it at home with egg white. Um, if you haven't uh, explored with egg whites at home, uh, they're really, really fun because they create this very velvety, frothy texture. Um, you're not going to hurt yourself or your friends. Salmonella is found on the outside of eggs, and we also live in the future. Like you really have to like find an egg under your couch and be like, I'm going to make a drink with this. <laughs> I better keep you guy. Screw me. Screw me over. Yes. Uh, question about using egg whites at home with Sometimes it works. You're not shaking it hard enough. Is it a dry shake first? And then so we do it opposite. Is that your question as well? So uh, do, you, is, do we happen to have an egg here? That would be amazing. <laughs> Somebody home? So does anybody have one egg in their heart? Who might shot? Come on. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised, right? All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna build this like a regular sour, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna shake it as if it was an egg white sour. Okay. So we'll start again with three quarter ounces of uh, fresh squeezed lemon juice. And then we're gonna do, I'm gonna do just three quarter ounces of the simple, but if we're gonna do an egg, we do one ounce. And then we're gonna do two ounces of immature brandy. <coughs> bitters are we doing Boulevard? Mahalo. Mahalo bitters. So Mahalo bitters are a blend of the Jamaican, the Blackstrap bitters kind of combined. Okay. Someone asked about the flavors of the Trinity and the Corazon. Trinity is our first <coughs> bitter that we that we produced after the main six that we launched in 2010. So the Trinity is actually a blend of the cherry bark, the orange, and the Boulevard. When we opened up Eat Street Social, the, the first year of uh, that bar program, we sold 24,000 old fashioned for quarter million dollars in one cocktail, which is amazing, right? It's a testament to like the collective like palate of an entire city, right? This is just like crotchety old men drinking old fashioned. Right? There's men and women of all ages, of all walks of life, enjoying this, this cocktail that, you know, we put a lot of care into. You know, we were, we were taking 700 pounds of, of ice that come in 300 pound blocks and chipping them down by hand. Um, every week, and uh, we're making this batch in 20 quart batches, uh, and then putting them in little individual bottles, and then you pour it. Has anybody had that drink before at Eat Street Social? Probably. Oh, yeah. At 24,000 of them, somebody <laughs> there should have had that. So on the on the menu, you know, so our, what we would always say is the Trinity of old fashioned bitters is the the cherry bark, the orange, and the bully bar. We always say that's the that's the old fashioned Trinity. Uh, and so, but on a menu, you can't write all that, right? It's too much, too many words. So we would just say, bitter keep Trinity bitters. Well, eventually enough guests were saying like, you guys should make the Trinity bitters. And we're like, no, you just buy these bottles and then blend them yourself. And then people are like, I'm never gonna do that. <laughs> I will never do that. I'm like, right now, like we can do it right now, together. They're like, no, you make them. <laughs> so we did, and we made, we, we made our first 50 gallon batch of this, this blend. And the end result was this, something really beautiful and brilliant, like we couldn't have expected, which was, you know, you, you know, bitters are a suspension, right? So you have these flavor molecules and fatty acids and lipids and terpenes that are suspended in a liquid. And so that suspension ha is where we get all the flavor from, right? So now if you take three suspensions and then combine them, something's going to happen. And if you give them time, so these are rested for 45 days, the end result is like crazier than all the sum, right? So like you could do the blend today and make a batch, and then make another batch in 45 days and taste them side by side, they're completely different. And so the end result is this really, really beautiful thing. And you know, we've been working on the bitters you know, for, for eight years now, and so to have something like that come out of like the, the hard work on three flavors is really cool. So they're kind of like our all-purpose bitters. You get the creaminess from the cherry bark, uh, citrus notes from the orange, and then that bitter backbone from the bully bar. 
And so they're kind of like a couple dashes and any cocktail is going to work really well. And then the Corazon are our newest bitters, and those are uh, five different types of dried peppers with coffee and chocolate. So they're kind of like a mole style uh, bitters, a chocolate coffee uh, bitters. And then what I wanted to do today was show people um, kind of that same idea of like blending. So you could make your own blends at home, right? Not, of course, uh, the majority of the population is going to tell me they don't do that. But if you are more of a DIY person, we basically have eight colors up there for you to draw with. And so you can take the bitters and make your own blend, and then you have your own house blend. And so we do that a lot too. So this is Mahalo bitters. This is kind of like our tiki bitters. So it's Jamaican number two, Jamaican number one, and Blackstrap uh, put together. And so is it two dashes in the... Uh, it is today. Okay. <laughs> well, I think I can. I think I'll be okay. All right. So we'll start with a regular shake on this egg white drink. Remember, we're pretending that it has egg whites in it. So all your shakes should be the same, like aggression or same amount of energy. Uh, but then what we talk about is the length of time that you shake. So if you have an egg white drink, you're going to shake that cocktail much longer. But all your all your shakes should be like this. If I'm doing a sparkling wine cocktail, it's going to be really short shake, but it's still going to be this aggressive, right? And then a standard shake would be much less than this as well, okay? So let's say that was my first shake. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my egg white sour, I'm going to strain it into back into the small tin, make sure I get everything out, and then I'm going to pitch my ice. And now we're going to do what's called a mime shake, right? So technically this would be called a reverse mime shake, but that's probably the geekiest cocktail thing I've said today, uh, I think, maybe not, but probably not, but it would be for you, uh, the geekiest cocktail thing you said. So it's, it's, a, it's a mime shake. What we mean by that is like you're shaking the drink, but there's no ice in it, right? So it's a mime thing, I guess. So now you, we can hear the ice crystals, right? The little chips. And as I shake harder and harder, those chips will start to break away and dissolve, and now we're just forcing air into the cocktail. So now we're really making that meringue. And so you'll get a, a bigger meringue, a thicker meringue. And then this was a big debate for us for like a year was, now do we tea strain it or not? And so a lot of times I would say, no, don't tea strain it, because you know what we're doing in, when we make an egg white drink is we're taking proteins and we're forcing them inside of themselves. And when you do that, they take in air. And so then the molecules start to expand, right? That's how a meringue is made. So if we pass it through a tea strainer, then we're breaking that meringue back down. So we're kind of defeating the purpose. But with research and development, OK, lots of drinking with friends. Uh, I get to call it research and development. I mean, that's pretty great, right? Oh, honey, you yeah. seem drunk. I was studying. <laughs> I am a flavor scientist. So we're going to double strain this, so if it had a big, thick, uh, uh, white froth on the top, we'd still pass it through, because actually what it does is it actually concentrates the foam, so you have this really pretty silk froth on the top, and then, then you would have a uh, whiskey sour, or a brandy sour, a piso sour, right? Cheers. Cheers. Delicious. So, immature brandy sour, that's what I'm going to make for you guys next. What's the drink after that? Beer and then we're going to do that. So I'm going to make those two drinks. I'm going to get them out for you. Then we'll stop again, and then we'll do it one more time, and we'll be done, okay? Thanks, guys.